All right, let's talk coffee futures hitting fresh highs. Price for Arabica beans reaching $2.15 per pound, the highest they have been since October 2014. This comes as Brazil's coffee crop is hit with a second frost in a month, unprecedented and on heels of a drought. Now, joining us now is Damien Mason, farm owner, agricultural economist, and author of Food Fear. Damien, thank you so much for being here. Let's start with this. What will the consumer, myself included, because I'm a big coffee drinker, see when they go to purchase a coffee at the grocery store or at, or at a coffee shop? Uh, thanks for having me on first. And secondly, you're probably not going to see that much of a big change. You know, uh, this is a real thing because Brazil producing 40 percent of the world's uh, coffee, experiencing two frosts coming also after a year of terrible drought, almost historic drought. So the coffee trees were weakened and then they get these frosts and they're predicted to have more of them. But the numbers say that Brazil is probably going to be offset this year and next year by about maybe as much as 10%. So if you got 40% of the globe's coffee production right there in Brazil and you've got a 10% deduct, it's sizable. But the reality is how much of that comes to you because of the true weather. And it's maybe you're talking what, 5% change. And when you compare it to other categories, maybe, you know, while you're picking up your bacon, I'm sorry, your coffee there at Dunkin' Donuts, you grab yourself a bacon sandwich. This chart sh shows that inflation from June of 2020 till June of 2021, bacon's up 8% and coffee had only been up half of a percent. So on a comparison basis, I think you're going to see less of a shock on coffee. Yeah, it's a blip right now. And people got very excited because coffee futures jumped 30 percent just in one week's time, which is substantial. But is that really going to have staying power? I would question that. But also, even if it does, how much are we talking about the, the consumer will absorb? You know, then it begin into the issues of elasticity of demand. Uh, while things are good and people are flush with cash, they'll still buy their $6 uh, Starbucks or their expensive uh, latte at Dunkin' Donuts. If it went up by a dollar, if it did increase 20 or 30 percent, would they still do that? Seems to me that the consumers are that are at the Dunkin' Donuts or Starbucks level are pretty, shall we say, um, non-price resistant. You know, if it goes from a $4.25 drink to a $5 drink, I'm thinking that's still going to happen. The more mid-level to lower income consumer at the grocery store seeing an impact, then we talk about the switch off. You know, like when beef goes up, they switch to pork. Pork goes up, they switch to poultry. So you might see that more on the Folgers or the uh, Maxwell House consumer than you would maybe at your level. Yeah, I mean, interesting there, you talk about elasticity of demand. We do see consumers kind of shrugging off uh, inflation when it comes to food, restaurants, and, and whatnot. Certainly, to your point, higher-end coffees, especially like Arabica, Arabica beans, uh, you know, they probably can afford the dent. We're seeing them shrug that off now. Uh, but let's talk about when it gets to $3, because we know analysts are talking about the price going up uh, to $3 per pound. How long is that going to last, and does that factor in, you know, does elasticity of demand factor in at that point? Is it that big yeah, of a it, 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 it certainly does. You know, um, then it becomes, do you need it? You know, used car prices have apparently been driving the inflation um, uh, bubble here up 10 half percent just in June, I believe is the number. So uh, you need a car arguably to get to work more uh, than you need a cup of joe. But again, it's a small luxury. What we've been seeing, if you look at everything during the um, the post pandemic or the coming out, if you will, is that those small luxuries consumers are not um, disallowing themselves. They're not disciplining themselves away from it. They're more of the idea like, you know, damn it, I sat on the couch and watched Netflix and decided I didn't like my family. I'm going to have that cup of Dunkin Donuts uh, fancy coffee right now. Um, but also you're saying are those prices here to stay? One thing that we always talk about, obviously, in economics is the cure for high prices is high prices. Um, you know, I'm out here in corn and soybean country in Indiana, and I can tell you that when a farmer can make $7 bushel corn or $6 bushel corn, $14 soybeans, they just produce the heck out of it and make more bushels. That's probably going to happen when it comes to coffee. A Bloomberg report states that on real dollars, wholesale price of coffee hasn't really moved since 1976. So does it have staying power? The one thing is I can grow a whole bunch more soybeans next year because it's a seasonal crop, whereas it takes six years really before you have a commercially viable coffee crop from a plant. So the turnaround is a great deal longer. So 
I'd say that we're probably going to see a little bit of a blip, but again, we're seeing it across the board everywhere, and it looks like the consumer's probably going to just absorb it. To that end, then, with the issues Brazil is having between the frost and then the drought conditions, where, where will we, we be getting our coffee from? Will there be a pivot to other parts of the world? Yeah, so I pulled up uh, the uh, top 10 coffee producers, and I know that I'm old fashioned. I still write things down. If you look <laughs> here, Brazil is not only number one by just a little bit, they're at 2.7 million metric tons of coffee produced last year. Compare that to number two producer, Vietnam, which is at one and a half. So you're talking nearly double just the difference between number one and number two global coffee producer. About 50 countries produce coffee. Uh, for export in the world. But as you can see, even the spread between number one, Brazil, and number five, Honduras, Honduras, the five number five coffee producer, is still hanging around at 475,000 metric tons as opposed to 2.7 million metric tons from Brazil. So it's going to take a lot of Hondurases and a lot of uh, Ethiopias to make up for Brazil. And also when you figure there's the time frame, meaning it's going to take six years. So yeah, yeah. we're going to see if demand stays the same and it is an elastic as we believe that it might be we'll see obviously with a reduced supply we'll see a little bit higher prices one thing that we also know that happens in agriculture is agriculture gets blamed oh crap they're not making as much coffee i'm going to now use that as a reason to put another buck on a cup of coffee we saw that with corn flakes in the uh, 2010 to 2012 range when corn was really really high priced yeah. and so kellogg's passes on a 25 cent per box uh new charge on frosted flakes blaming the cost of corn but if it, corn went up from three fifty a bushel to seven dollars a bushel, it only took them fourteen boxes of frosted flakes to pay for that bushel of corn, and then they ended up making ten dollars and fifty cents of new profit off of every bushel of corn that they processed and put into a Tony the Tiger box. So you see that a lot. I wouldn't be surprised if we see a lot of coffee sellers, coffee yeah. retailers using this as an opportunity to say, yeah, we heard about that bad weather, that climate change, <laughs> that problem in Brazil, and here you go, an extra fifty cents for your cup of joe. Yeah, I could talk to you all day about this. You're so excited about understanding the complexities in terms of, uh, you know, the impacts this has on agriculture. Thank you so much for your insight. Damian Mason, farm owner, agricultural economist, author of Food Fear.